Hi guys, I'm Seymour Duncan. Uh, glad you made it here to Seymour Duncan. What I'm doing right now, I'm uh, hand winding uh, an antiquity pickup. We have uh, many models that we've we built. I always like the term antiquity. So I started making pickups that uh, would look uh, like they're maybe 50 years old already. And you can see that uh, we try to, we do use all the correct materials, you know, from the bottom plate, nickel silvers, and the, the wood spacer, and the, the special butyrate plastic. There's all different versions of butyrate, and we use the correct version. Most of our wire are pretty much custom made for us, the uh, plain enamel that we use on this particular pickup. And uh, basically, I started uh, being very interested in and playing guitar when I was a young kid. My uncle, uh, Howard Duncan, who's the, the brother of my dad, uh, played. He had an old Martin acoustic, and uh, he showed me my first uh, cowboy uh, chords. And uh, it was a D chord, and an A chord, and a C chord, and a G chord. So. Every day I would go after school over to his house and uh, pick up his guitar and just practice every day, every day, every day. And a few months later, um, I had a Sears Silvertone catalog and I wanted to get a certain kind of guitar out of it. And there was a real cool guitar uh, that looked like a Les Paul, had gold sparkle on it, it was black, it had like a cream binding and a simulated uh, ebony fingerboard. I marked it in the catalog and uh, so my first Christmas, I was 12 years old, came along and I saw the box and I opened it up and, and I was in shock. <laughs> you know, my family, uh, instead of get, getting me a guitar, they bought me an accordion. And uh, because my family, we were watching a Lawrence Welk show and every week I would wa watch it and uh, watch a guitar player by the name of Neil Levang. Neil Levang was a great guitar player with Buddy Merrill and uh, I'd watch Neil get up and he would play a telly or a jazz master or a strat and do instrumentals like ghost riders in the sky wheels um, calcutta and uh, so that was the first guy i actually really saw and then there was uh, james burton with ricky nelson and he was such a great influence and he was playing a telecaster and then over the years i uh, my family took me to steel pier in atlantic city where i first uh, was introduced to les paul and mary ford and they took me to a, a a matinee during a Saturday on Steel Pier and I went in and uh, uh, sat in the front row and all of a sudden I hear dear 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 how high the moon was playing it was Les Paul and Mary Ford and the curtains opened up then after the show uh, my uncle took me backstage and uh, introduced me to Les and uh, that was like the thrill of the lifetime I mean it was the first like professional I ever saw in person and uh, I asked him all these questions about the pickups and about the pulverizer on his guitar and everything. So that was, that was a, such a big influence to me. So the following year, I was 13, I finally uh, got my Sears Silvertone guitar. So that was the start of it. And every day I would uh, play and practice and practice. And, and I was listening to all the great guitar players back then, you know, uh, with Bill Doggett, you know, and there was a, um, he was a Hammond player and he had a song called Honky Tonk, which I thought was great. And then there was a great guitar player by the name of Dwayne Eddy, who had many hit instrumentals and was touring with the Dick Clark Show. And then there was a, another great guitar player by the name of Lonnie Mack, had a record called Memphis and Wham. And um, he was just an incredible player, played a flying V through a magnetone amplifier. And then probably my all time favorite band was a band called The Ventures with a Don Wilson, you know, Bob Bogle, Noki Edwards that played bass but later played lead guitar. So for me, having that as um, an influence, uh, I had my homework set out for me because I'd buy the records and then I would learn as much as I could from each record. So for me, uh, I was quite thrilled to uh, later in life have a chance to meet all these great artists that I grew up listening to. So that started that whole thing, and then I had uh, been playing around. We toured with the Shirelles when I was quite young, and then we uh, and I ended up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I was playing with a group there. And then we uh, traveled all over uh, the Midwest, and then I started meeting all these other guitar players from up in Chicago. I met Jim McCarty from the Detroit Wheels, who was a, another great guitar player. Cal Collins was in Cincinnati. Um, 
Bill Bartlett was in a band called the Lemon Pipers and he had a record called the Green Tambourine and so him and I would hang out all the time and we'd trade guitar notes and everything. Then during that time I was working uh, for Dodd Music Center and I met, um, when I first got to town I met this uh, guy playing drums who just had a great voice. I, mean, I was so uh, uh, inspired by him and uh, it was a guy by the name of Adrian Ballou. And Adrian uh, and I had been very good friends. I moved to New York, working with a band called The Sidekicks for a short time, and uh, I was basically their like manager, tour manager. And then uh, John Spirit, the uh, drummer, uh, broke his ankle, and I ended up being the drummer with the band. And then I would play guitar every once in a while, so that that was fun. And then just traveling, you know, around. Uh, uh, when I was playing Wildwood, this guitar player would come down all the time and, and show me his new Les Paul or I'd go see his guitar collection and stuff that he had and uh, it was Todd Rundgren. So he was playing in Wildwood, a place called Second of Autumn. So I had all these great people that I would meet and I sat in with the Flamingos at a club in Wildwood. One of the other first bands I met were the Fenderman, who had a record called Mule Skinner Blues. And it was, a, if you ever get that album by the Fenderman, the, the original album, uh, listen to guitar work on it with Jim Sunquist, and uh, he was a great guitar player. And another one of my influences was uh, George Tomsko with a band called The Fireballs. And The Fireballs had a lot of instrumental hits out, Torque and Bulldog and one called Quite a Party. Then during that time I worked for CBS Television. I had a great time working for television. I worked for Scripps Howard Broadcasting and then uh, I became a technician, I was in the ham radio, then uh, I did a show with Joe Walsh, and Joe Walsh and I were the only guys in Cincinnati at the time that were playing Yardbird songs. This was around like 1966, 67, and we were doing Train Kept Rolling and uh, I'm a Man and all these songs. We were playing the local clubs in Cincinnati. During the week, I'd be working back in the television station, and then I I did some shows and I backed up a bunch of artists that came on the show. Jerry Reed was there. He borrowed one of my one of my telecasters at one time and one of my deluxe reverbs for a show he was doing. And then uh, this one guy said, man, you should be playing, you know, and uh, it was Roy Buchanan. And so uh, I went to Europe with Roy Buchanan in 1973 and the end of 72, beginning of 73. And then uh, hooked up with him, and then I got um, I went to Polydor Records with him, and I met a guy named Jay Rich, who was his manager, and they got me set up with a guy named Wayne Bickerton. And Wayne says, "Well, we have an artist that uh, needs a guitar player, and his name was uh, Chris Harley, and his stage name was Chris Rainbow, and he was a uh, an art a singer and songwriter that uh, was to me most so incredible. You know, he would sing." four-part harmony, just like the Beach Boys, and add five and six parts, you know, the guy was absolutely amazing. 